How are religion and Christianity presented in Charles Dickens' novella, A Christmas Carol? Let's find out. How's it going, Revision Squad? It's me, Liam, aka Mr. Knight, aka Dystopia Junkie. And in this video, we're going to think about how religion and Christianity are depicted in Charles Dickens' novella, A Christmas Carol. To do this, we are going to look at some important contextual information and analyse some key quotations, both of which I hope will help you out as you study or revise Dickens' classic Christmas tale. As ever, I strongly recommend you've got a pen and some paper in front of you as you watch this video. That way, you will be able to make some notes of all the things I say and write, and I promise you, I'm going to be covering quite a bit in this video. If you find anything I mentioned helpful, please do let me know by dropping it a like, writing me a comment, sharing it with anyone who you think might find it useful, and, of course, subscribing if you aren't already. Now, in the month of January, only 19% of my watch time came from subscribers. So if you're in that 81%, why not sub up and help me to help even more people? I really would appreciate it loads. All right, cringy YouTuber stuff out of the way. What important contextual information might help us to understand the depiction of religion and Christianity in Charles Dickens' story? Remember that most exam boards want you to apply your understanding of the historical, political and social backgrounds of Victorian texts to your analysis of them. Without including context, you're going to really struggle to get those top, top grades, which is something I don't think any of us want, really. So, first of all, it is important for us to recognise that Christianity, in all of its various forms, was the most widespread religious belief in Victorian England. The reason why I want to say this first is because that means that most of the time in this video, the terms religion and Christianity will probably be used interchangeably. Now that isn't to say that other religions didn't exist in Victorian England, it's just that Christianity is the religion that is most relevant to Dickens' story. Anyway, attending church was an important part of many people's lives, and this was something that was actively encouraged by employers and schools perhaps showing that religion was more important in the Victorian era than it is today. Now, a number of different Christian denominations were prevalent in the Victorian era. In simple terms, this means that there were lots of different kinds of Christians, which resulted in some subtle differences in what people believed and how they practiced their faith. This is something that we might see crop up in A Christmas Carol. Dickens himself, it should be noted, was a passionate Christian who wanted his writings to be seen as parables, which is a word meaning stories that emphasise the teachings of Christ. In particular, Dickens was fond of the love, humility and positive values that are apparent in those teachings, which suggests that he ultimately sees religion as being something that just helps people to be better human beings. Now I wonder, how might that relate to A Christmas Carol? Now, charity and redemption are also important to Christianity and how it is presented in our story, as is the fact that the story takes place at Christmas time, although we should also remember that Christmas celebrations do have roots in paganism as well. But the thing is, I'm not going to cover these ideas in too much detail in this video. That's because I've already made videos about charity and Christmas, and I'm planning on making my video about redemption very, very soon as well. So if you want ideas that specifically relate to those concepts, it's probably worth checking out those videos. So if these are some of the important contextual facts for us to consider in relation to A Christmas Carol, any others that become relevant will be mentioned at the time, which quotations could we discuss in order to analyse the depiction of religion and Christianity in Dickens's story? As I'm sure you know by now, if you've watched any of my other videos about A Christmas Carol, all of the page references I make in this video refer to this copy of the book. Now, if you have a different copy, our page numbers will probably be different. 
Hopefully, though, I still make it pretty clear whereabouts in the story they come from, though. So, our first quotation comes right at the start of the story, only a page or two into it. Dickens writes, Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge, a squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. So with religion and Christianity in mind, I would say that this quotation makes it pretty clear that Scrooge's money-obsessed personality is equated to sin. Now, this is important because Scrooge is presented as the antithesis to good Christian behaviour right at the beginning of the story, meaning that straight away Dickens is criticising those who prioritise their own wealth over the well-being of others. Now, this isn't the most exciting piece of analysis in the world, but it is important, as it shows the author expressing a strong viewpoint straight away, and is something that underpins many of the arguments or points that he makes throughout the novella. Our second quotation can also be found in stave one, once Scrooge has left work for the day. Dickens describes the sights of London on Christmas Eve, and spends a particularly lengthy paragraph describing a nearby church. He writes, The ancient tower of a church, whose gruff old bell was always peeping slyly down at Scrooge out of a gothic window in the wall, became invisible. Now, although seemingly unimportant, I actually think that this quotation is pretty interesting. You see, wrapped up within this quotation are two pretty important techniques. Dickens has used both personification, as seen in Always Peeping Slyly to describe the bell, and synecdoche, in which a part, the church bell, is being used to represent a larger whole, which in this case I see as being God, to suggest that God is always watching over Scrooge, but at a distance, implying that whereas God might be interested in Scrooge's life, actions and well-being, Scrooge has put a distance between them by not practising proper Christian behaviour. Interpreting the quotation in this way could explain later events. God's interest in Scrooge might explain why he has permitted a chance at redemption, for instance, whilst also reinforcing the idea that Scrooge is a bad Christian, which is something that Dickens establishes and re-establishes throughout the first stave in particular. Now we're staying in stave one for our third quotation, but this time we're going to look at something Jacob Marley's ghost says. So the ghost of Scrooge's former business partner describes its existence as No rest, no peace, incessant torture of remorse. Now to me, this torturous, restless existence sounds an awful lot like the concept of purgatory. Now, purgatory is believed to be sort of like heaven's waiting room. Apart from whilst your soul is there, you make amends for all of the sins you committed in life. As we know, judging by the length and weight of his chains, Marley committed an awful lot of sin in life, and he tells Scrooge that he has been roaming the world for the entirety of the seven years since his death. Now all of this is to say that Dickens is making it pretty clear that a selfish and greedy lifestyle will not be rewarded in the afterlife. Rather, it is something that will be torturously punished. I think it's pretty clear already what kind of lifestyle Dickens is encouraging his readers to abandon. It's just interesting that he's using a sort of religious metaphysical threat as a means of deterring people from it in the first place. All right, we're going to skip forwards to stave two for a moment. In particular, I want us to look at Belle's dialogue when she breaks up with Scrooge. When Scrooge asks her what idol she thinks has displaced her in his mind, she replies with a golden one. Now, this metaphor suggests to me that Scrooge's priorities in life are almost blasphemous. The word idol has significant religious connotations, as one of its meanings is a symbol or relic that is meant to represent God in order to assist with worship. Because this idol is a golden one, it is clear that Bell thinks that Scrooge prioritises and essentially worships 
money and wealth, rather than her or indeed God. Scrooge's greed, which is one of the cardinal sins of course, seems to have already totally consumed him by this point in his life, suggesting that he has sinned for many, many, many years. For our next quotation, let's jump to stave three, okay? In particular, I want to look at the dialogue held between Scrooge and the ghost of Christmas present as they wander around the streets of London. Scrooge asserts that the spirit must be in favour of bakeries completely closing on Sundays, since doing so is done in the name of religious worship, which Scrooge calls being done in the spirit's name, suggesting that he sees the spirit as being related to the Christian God in some way. The spirit's response, however, is really important to look at. Almost angrily, it replies, There are some upon this earth of yours, returns the spirit, who lay claim to know us, and who do their deeds of passion, pride, ill will, hatred, envy, bigotry, and selfishness in our name, who are as strange to us and all our kith and kin as if they had never lived. Remember that and charge their doings on themselves, not us. What the spirit means here is that there are people who claim to do things in the name of God or religion, but then go ahead and do things that are selfish, hateful, etc. Almost as if the moralistic Christian teachings are things that they have never encountered before. Obviously, there's a lot of hypocrisy going on there, claiming to do totally unchristian things in the name of Christianity. And I think it's precisely this that Dickens is trying to show contempt for. As I'm sure you know by now, the Victorian era was a time of great social inequality and, for the poor, immense suffering. And yet the very people who perpetuated this inequality and suffering were likely to be Christian, giving the faith's prevalence at the time. By demonstrating such hypocritical attitudes in a negative light, it is clear that Dickens wants his Christian readers to behave in a truly Christian way in all aspects of their lives, rather than just when it suits them. Our second to last quotation comes from Stave 4. More specifically, it occurs in the scene in which we visit the Cratchits and see how terribly sad they are about Tiny Tim's death. Now, as soon as we enter their household, a line of dialogue is spoken by Peter Cratchit, the eldest Cratchit's son, immediately following which is a piece of narration that reveals Scrooge's reaction. The two lines in question are as follows. And he took a child and set him in the midst of them. Where had Scrooge heard those words? With religion and Christianity in mind, this quotation is actually quite useful, even if it seems to be quite a small or minor moment in the story. The top part of this quotation is actually a quotation from another text. You'll probably see in your copy of the story that it is in double quotation marks, one set telling us that a character is speaking and the other telling us that they are quoting something else. In particular, Peter Cratchit is quoting from the Bible. More specifically, he is quoting Matthew chapter 18, verse 2, which, if my research is accurate, means that it comes from the first book of the New Testament, the half of the Bible that is concerned with Jesus' life, and the half of the Bible that Dickens was known to be a particular fan of. Now, in reading the Bible at a difficult time, such as the one that the Cratchits are experiencing, especially a verse that is so clearly concerned with children, I think Dickens is trying to show that the Bible, and therefore faith, can provide individuals with great comfort in moments of pain and difficulty, making this quotation something of a celebration of faith. Indeed, the choice of Bible verse was very delicately made by Dickens. Now, I'm not religious, and that's something I probably should have mentioned earlier in the video. But a quick bit of research tells me that the Bible verse is about Jesus using a child as an example of somebody humble and pure when asked what type of person is the greatest in heaven. I think the fact that this is used in the context of Tiny Tim's passing is particularly telling, as it allows Peter Cratchit to remind himself and his family of Tiny Tim's humility and purity 
whilst also reassuring him that he is now in heaven with Jesus Christ. It's a double whammy, celebrating Tiny Tim and comforting the family who are mourning him. Very cleverly done, Mr Dickens. Now, I haven't mentioned Scrooge's response yet. In wondering where he had the quotation before, we get the impression that Scrooge is unfamiliar with the Bible, which reinforces the idea that Scrooge has been a bad Christian for a very long time. As much as he is starting to show some really positive signs by this point in the story, he has still neglected his faith for a very long time, suggesting that he still has a long way to go until he is properly transformed. All right, our last quotation comes from stave five. After buying a turkey for the Cratchits, but before he goes to Fred's house for Christmas day, we learn that Scrooge went to church and found that everything could yield him pleasure. Now my analysis of this quotation is short and simple. Scrooge is clearly transformed in stave five, and one of the ways in which he is transformed is in his embracement of faith. In attending church, Presumably for the first time in a while, he is growing closer to God and becoming, in Dickens' view at least, a better person. Although not the most interesting quotation from a linguistic perspective, it contrasts really nicely with the distance Scrooge puts between himself and the church earlier in the story, and so you could do some really great comparison work with this quotation. Now this is my last quotation for this video. Sort of. At this point, I would usually jump into a summary, and although that is still on its way, there's actually some deeper conceptual analysis that I would like to do first. Hold on, because I really do think that what we are about to cover next will help you to get those top, top grades. The idea that I would like to talk about is that there are a number of parallels between the Holy Trinity of Christian faith and the Christmas spirits, by which I mean the ghosts of Christmases past, present and yet to come. So firstly, what is the Holy Trinity? Well, it is a belief held by some Christians, which is that God manifests as three distinct and equal persons, which are the Father, Son and Holy Ghost. This is kind of like saying that God has three distinct aspects or personas, I think. I'm aware that that's a massive oversimplification and it's probably slightly wrong, but it is the entities themselves that are really important here, rather than how exactly they relate to each other. So, the Holy Trinity has three parts. The first is the Father, which is seen as a loving creator and sustainer of life. Second is the Son, who is Jesus Christ, God's incarnation on earth. Last is the Holy Ghost, also sometimes called the Holy Spirit, which is seen as the manifestation of God's powers on earth. It doesn't have a physical form and is instead seen by what it causes to happen. So if someone witnessed a miracle to happen, say a blind person could suddenly see again, that would be evidence of the Holy Spirit. Now this member of the Trinity also has connections with life and the soul, and it also played some part in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now that's all well and good, and I hope it covers enough information for you to have some sort of idea about the Holy Trinity. But why am I telling you about all of this? How is it relevant to the Christmas spirits? Right, well let's think about the Father again. I wonder, could the ghost of Christmas present be compared to this figure? After all, wouldn't you say that this spirit is pretty loving, or at the very least, compassionate and friendly? For instance, the way in which it greets Scrooge is pretty friendly, and certainly displays the sort of attitude that would befit the Christian figure of the Father. Furthermore, isn't there something creatorly, or at the very least, paternal, in how it shields ignorance and want in the foldings of its robe? and how it looks after them after they have been rejected by mankind. And if we want to think about how the ghost of Christmas present is a sustainer of a life, much like the figure of the father, why not think about how it sprinkles incense on the dinners of the poor, and how it is strongly associated with food and sustenance and feasting, as made evident by the huge list of Christmas food that accompanies its initial description. 
If we consider these aspects of the ghost of Christmas present, couldn't we see it as symbolising the figure of the father? And what could we say about the figure of the son, you know, Jesus Christ? Well, I wonder if the ghost of Christmas past has parallels with the son. You see, although Jesus is initially presented as a baby in the Bible, he is also God, making him both infinitely wise and incredibly young, which is sort of mirrored by the ghost of Christmas past's physical appearance, because it is also both childlike and old at the same time. Jesus also has a reputation for being a moralistic teacher in the Bible, which is also the role that the ghost of Christmas past serves to Scrooge, such as when it makes the pointed comment about how Fezziwig's small act of generosity has an enormous positive impact on other people. Now, Jesus is also called the light of the world in the Bible because he illuminates the truth. The ghost of Christmas past is literally a light, thanks to the radiance that emits from its head, whereas reminding Scrooge of his past, showing him his former mistakes and the lessons that he didn't learn the first time around, well, that's sort of like showing Scrooge his truth, isn't it? Right, that is the father and son discussed, as well as two of the Christmas spirits. No prizes for guessing which combination we will talk about next. Could we compare the ghost of Christmas yet to come with the figure of the Holy Ghost. Now, I know that most of you will probably want to compare this Christmas spirit to the Grim Reaper, and that's fair enough, but please hear me out for just a moment. If the Holy Ghost is seen as the manifestation of God's powers on earth, well, isn't seeing into the future super powerful? The other two Christmas spirits have shown Scrooge stuff that he either already knows, his past, or things he could witness anyway, his present, whereas there is literally no other way, aside from divine or supernatural intervention, for Scrooge to see his future. Additionally, if the Holy Ghost has connections with life and the soul, isn't the fact that the ghost of Christmas yet to come show Scrooge his death also within the remit of the Holy Ghost? After all, death is only on the opposite side of the coin to life. Finally, the Holy Ghost is thought to have played some part in the resurrection of Christ. And doesn't the ghost of Christmas yet to come play a significant role in Scrooge's redemption, which could be seen as his spiritual resurrection? After all, Scrooge only vows to honour Christmas after seeing the bleak future this spirit offers him. As much as he was changed or influenced by what the other Christmas ghosts showed him, it was the ghost of Christmas yet to come that truly oversaw Scrooge's redemption. So that's the three parts of the Holy Trinity and the possible parallels that the Christmas spirits share with them covered. I'm aware that got quite deep, so I guess I should really ask now, what was the point in me mentioning that to you? How will it help you to write about Dickens's story? Basically, in explaining how each Christmas spirit could be seen as a symbol for a part of the Holy Trinity, you could write a really compelling essay about how a Christmas carol really was Dickens's way of writing a parable. Although there are few explicit religious references in the story, Christian messages are only ever just under the surface or disguised as something else, all of which are used with the intention of encouraging Dickens's readers to behave in more Christian ways and undo the injustices of social inequality. Blimey. All right, that is my two-part quotation analysis complete. As we start to wrap up, I would like to consider how we could summarise the use of religion and Christianity in Dickens's novella. Well, such a summary might look a bit like this. A devout Christian, Dickens wrote a Christmas carol with a deeper religious meaning. Although his story is not explicitly about Christianity and the teachings of Jesus Christ, Many of the moralistic lessons found within it, such as compassion for others and the importance of generosity, have their roots in Christian doctrine. Throughout his novella, and particularly in the presentation of Scrooge, Dickens suggests that embracing Christian ideology makes you not only a better person, but a better member of society, whilst also suggesting its opposite too. 
turning one's back on Christian values leads to a miserable, wicked existence in both this life and the next one. So if you think it would be useful to copy that summary down, either because you think it would work as an introduction, will jog your memory when it comes to revising, or because you like how I've interwoven context and intentions, please be my guest. And now for some final bits and bobs before the video ends. First, a question. Out of all of the quotations I've mentioned in this video, or any others that you know, which quotation do you think is most important to remember when it comes to this theme, and why? Now, you are welcome to use this question to prompt a mind map, flashcard, or short evaluative essay, and you are especially welcome to share any ideas you have down in the comments section. I always really enjoy seeing the ideas that you lot come up with, and I'm usually pretty good at giving some informal feedback too, so why not give it a go? If you want some additional ideas to further develop your understanding of this theme, why not consider how Tiny Tim and Fred, among other characters, present Christian ideals in a positive light? Or why not look at how Scrooge's burial site in Stave 4 might be relevant to this theme? Isn't it pretty overgrown and uncared for? What might that represent? And if you want to watch some more videos or do some additional reading, please do have a look at my videos about Christmas, generosity and redemption, all of which have some relation to Christianity in some way, or why not have a browse of the web pages I've listed in my bibliography, all of which I have included because I found them useful when making this video and also because they will provide you with even more contextual information, which should develop your understanding of this topic all the more. Blimey. That really was a lot, but I can now say that my discussion of the presentation of religion and Christianity in A Christmas Carol is complete. Hopefully you are able to take something away from this video that will help you out as you study, revise, or otherwise engage with Dickens's story, especially if you're stuck at home doing some lockdown learning. If this video has been helpful in any way, well, I'm sure you know what to do. I'm not going to repeat that cringy YouTuber stuff again. Anyway, as ever, I hope that you have an awesome rest of the day. If you are revising, please do remember to take frequent short breaks, as a burned out student is not a happy or successful student, which is what I think you deserve to be. So how are religion and Christianity presented in A Christmas Carol? I think it's pretty clear that their absence, so the rejection or desertion of Christian doctrine, is shown to be negative, whereas upholding strong religious values is shown to make somebody a good person. All of this is to say that Dickens' story really is a parable, one written with the intent of encouraging people to use their faith to make the world a better place.